Sometimes it feels to me like the world's become obsessed by the brain. Uh, today, there are, you can get brain drinks like Neurosonic and Neurobliss. Uh, there are supposedly neuroscience-inspired music apps that promise to boost your attention by 500%. Uh, you've probably seen the newspaper articles that say things like, uh, this is why your brain is addicted to email, this is why your brain loves Netflix. And uh, you'll notice it's, it, these days it's your brain that's addicted, it's not you anymore, it's, it's your brain. Uh, virtually every day there's a lovely splash of a brain scan in a newspaper, some new study being reported, some new breakthrough. It is certainly true that these are exciting times for neuroscience. Um, the last couple of years have seen massive new investments in brain science in, in Europe and in the US. Um, but I think President Obama had it right when he introduced the so-called Brain Initiative uh, in the States. He pointed out that uh, today we're able to identify galaxies light years away. Uh, we can study particles smaller than an atom. But he, he said the three pounds of matter inside our heads remains largely, largely mysterious. And I think he's right. And I, the problem is that mix of hype and excitement uh, that, that you see in the media combined with that relative ignorance that we have is a perfect breeding ground for brain myths, uh, for misconceptions, uh, uh, neurobones, what one British blogger calls neurobolics. <laughs> uh, new fields are emerging like uh, neuroaesthetics, neuroleadership, neuromanagement. My favorite I saw the other day was neurolovology. There's, there's an actual book on that that you can buy, came out last year. Um, and this, uh, this applies to learning and education too, because there's a real hunger to apply neuroscience to education. But a lot of the time, people are getting ahead of the evidence. Uh, so you find there's quite a lot of pseudoscience around. Uh, OK, so my talk is going to really be in two halves. So the first half, I'm going to look at some brain myths that pertain to education and learning. And second half, I'm going to talk about some genuine evidence-backed learning tricks that are really based on psychology more than neuroscience. OK, so let's start with, uh, I've got a quiz for you. I'm going to put five uh, uh, statements about the brain up, on, up here. Uh, the first, uh, right brain people are more creative, left brain people are more analytical. Most of us only use 10% of our brains. Uh, women have more balanced activity across their brains than men. Uh, people learn better when they're taught via their preferred uh, learning style. So maybe if you're a visual learner, you learn better when you're taught visually. And finally, uh, performing kind of physical coordination exercises, uh, bouncing balls and crawling and so on, as found in a very popular program called Brain Gym can improve the uh, integrate, can help integrate function across the brain hemispheres. Uh, so I'd like to ask you to spend the next five minutes, uh, maybe if you turn around and uh, in groups of four, so uh, people turn around and speak to the two people behind them, and spend five minutes uh, going through these, see what you think, see which ones you think are true and which one's false. Uh, and then we'll come back in five minutes. Okay, let's... Let's, can we do a show of hands? Who, who, thinks, uh, who thinks right brain people are more creative, that this is a, a fact about the brain? No one. <laughs> You're thinking probably not. OK. <laughs> who, who believes it's true that we only use 10% of our brains? A few. <laughs> yeah, a few. Uh, OK, who thinks that uh, women have more balanced brains than men? Oh, all the women. <laughs> all the women in the room, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, who thinks people learn better when taught via their preferred learning style? There's a few, but the majority think not. And what about these uh, physical exercises that are used in schools? Uh, can they really help improve function across the brain hemispheres? Yes. A lot of you think this is true. 
Okay, that's interesting. Uh, as I think some of you have guessed, uh, or you realized yourselves, uh, these were all uh, <laughs> based, yeah, uh, based on uh, mainstream neuroscience evidence. These are all deemed to be uh, false. So the first one, actually, anyone who, very few of you believe this, but recent surveys have found that 91% uh, of UK teachers uh, believe that it's true, that right brain people are more creative. Uh, the next one, 10% myth, uh, nearly half of UK teachers think this is true. I mean, I don't mean to pick on teachers, it's just uh, a survey. <laughs> there is survey evidence uh, recently been done, so we have a figure for it. Uh, this was not in the survey, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll come on to, there are lots of gender brain myths swirling around. Um, the preferred learning styles theory, not many of you in, uh, endorse that here, but it is a very, very popular idea. Uh, and brain gym is, uh, again, even though the majority of you in here were skeptical, it's a very, very popular uh, program and including among teachers in our country and schools. So uh, for the next part of the talk, I'm just going to go through these five. Uh, you'll, it sounds like uh, you know, I'm going to be preaching to the converted a little bit, but I'll go through these five to explain why they are myths based on uh, neuroscience evidence and also give you, tell you a little bit about where, the, where they come from. Uh, so the left brain, right brain idea, uh, this is illustrated nicely in this. This is a Mercedes-Benz advert from a few years ago. Uh, and uh, it, it says, uh, I, on, the, on the left it says, I won't read the whole thing, but it says, I am the left brain, I am a scientist, a mathematician, I am logic. On the right hand side it says, I am the right brain, I am creativity, a free spirit, I am passion. It's a very, very uh, popular idea. It's become a powerful metaphor for two different kinds of people uh, in the world, you know, analytical people, creative people. Uh, you can see these kind of Keech products, uh, gift shop products like this one uh, around. Now, it's certainly true that the, the brain is uh, divided in half down the middle, the two hemispheres, uh, by this physio. And it's, it is true that the hemispheres are, do work differently in some ways. The most obvious difference is the left hemisphere, many of you will know, is uh, usually the dominant hemisphere for language in most people. Uh, but crucially, the two brain hemispheres, they're joined by uh, this huge bundle of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum, uh, which the, uh, you know, House MD, the uh, fictional doctor, he calls it the George Washington Bridge of the brain. There's so much crosstalk between the two hemispheres. So usually our brain hemisp hemispheres work together on, on whatever we're doing. Uh, just to illustrate how the reality about uh, hemisphere function is complicated. There's some interesting research from the 90s. So in one study, they asked participants to uh, either, uh, let, let's take uh, this letter here. Sometimes they wanted them to identify the big letter. So like the letter H here. Yeah? Sometimes they wanted participants to focus on the little letters that make up the big letter. And what they found, they, they showed the stimuli to either just the left hemisphere or just the right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what they found seemed to support the myth at first, because the right hemisphere was quicker at identifying the big letter, uh, whereas the left hemisphere, people were quicker at identifying the little letters. And this seemed to support this idea of right hemisphere holistic thinking, you know, the, the big picture, and the left hemisphere, the detail. So it seemed uh, a neat, neat study that supported the myth. Uh, but then uh, they used stimuli, very similar, but now they used little objects. So it's not very clear, this picture. I got, I got this from the paper. Um, let's take this one. So it's a bell uh, here made up of little ships. So the same idea. The task was either to identify the little object or the, or the big object. And again, the stimuli were either shown left hemisphere, right hemisphere. This time, the findings were completely reversed. So now it was the supposed analytical left hemisphere uh, that was actually quicker at spotting, uh, identifying the, the big object. So completely contradicting the, the myth and uh, contradicting the first study. So showing how messy these results often are. Uh, 
also counting against the myth, uh, split brain research. So these are patients who have had their hemispheres uh, cut uh, as a last ditch treatment for epilepsy. I won't go through this whole thing, but basically it's a picture, max, picture matching task. And um, so they have to match these little pictures here with the big ones here. And um, the patient, uh, the right hemisphere has picked a shovel uh, to, cl to clear up this snow. And the, the patient is asked, why, did you, why have you picked uh, the shovel? And it's the left hemisphere that speaks. And the left hemisphere can't see the snowy scene. So the left hemisphere doesn't really know why the right hemisphere has picked the shovel. But rather than saying, I don't know why I picked the shovel, it doesn't match a chicken, a chicken foot over here. Uh, the so-called analytical, logical left hemisphere makes up a story, makes up a story and says, well, I think I, 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 think I picked the shovel because uh, it's to clear out the chicken shed. And the researchers doing this, they called this uh, the interpreter effect. And uh, one of the lead researchers, Michael Gazzaniga, said it shows that the left hemisphere tell stories. The left hemisphere is actually very creative. Uh, finally, final piece of evidence. This was just from last year. Uh, this is a brain imaging study that looked at uh, functional hubs in the brain. And the researchers wanted to see if some people have more functional hubs on one side of their brain and other people have more functional hubs on the other, which might support the idea of some people being left brain, some people right brain. They found no evidence for this whatsoever. So, I mean, it's a very, it's a very brief overview, but the picture is complex, it's messy, and it doesn't really support this simple idea of right brain, left brain. But that doesn't stop people writing books like this one, War in the Boardroom, uh, Why Left Brain Management and Right Brain Marketing Don't See Eye to Eye. And it is unfortunate because I think people get pigeonholed as either, sometimes in business as either left brain or right brain, and, and children too. You know, you're, you're not a creative person, you're a, you're a left brain person. And it, it's nonsense, really. If, you know, neuroscience says if you've got a brain, you're capable of being creative. You know, don't worry about this left brain, right brain stuff. OK, the 10% myth. I will just show you, in case you don't know what the myth is, uh, it was perfectly captured by a movie last summer, which you might have heard, called Lucy with Scarlett Johansson. So I just play you a clip of the trailer. It is estimated most human beings only use 10% of the brain's capacity. Imagine if we could access 100%. Interesting things begin to happen. Yes? Professor Norman, my name's Lucy. I just read all your research on the human brain. It's a little rudimentary, but you're on the right track. Thank you. I have access to 28% of my cerebral capacity. I can feel every living thing. Since when did you start writing Chinese? Since an hour ago. What happens when she reaches 100%? I have no idea. Apparently, according to that film, when you use 100%, you know, you can change your hair color. <laughs> and uh, it's very useful, and you can throw objects around with your mind. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's obviously far-fetched. Uh, it's not the only movie to look into this kind of uh, premise. You, you might remember Limitless. I think they put a 20% figure on it. Uh, he takes a drug that unlocks his potential. Uh, this myth, a lot of people have tried to trace the origins of this very, very popular idea that we only use 10% of our brains. Uh, one theory is that it, it comes from this absolutely mega-selling book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, published in 1936. Uh, it had a preface written by the journalist Lau Thomas. And he misquoted the great American psychologist, William James. William James had this idea about latent mental energy, which was really about our potential to learn more. Um, but Lau Thomas, he put this 10% figure on it, and uh, he made it sound more like it's the amount of our brain that we're using. So that's one idea is that it comes from this book, uh, because it was read by millions and millions and millions of people. Uh, some people trace it back further. So in the 19th century, some experiments were done by a French scientist, uh, Jean-Pierre Florent, excuse my pronunciation. And he, um, he did lots of experiments with animals where he took, took away more and more of their cortex to see what effect it would have. And he often found, according to his observations, it didn't seem to have any effect at all. 
So that's an, you know, that leading to the idea that lots of the brain is unused. Uh, back again in the 1930s, the Canadian neurosurgeon uh, Wilder Penfield, uh, he, did the, he, he did these ex studies with epilepsy patients when they were undergoing neurosurgery, uh, where he applied stimulation to the, actually directly to their brain, and he found these areas of what he called silent cortex, where stimula <coughs> stimulating these areas didn't seem to provoke any effect in, in the patients. But we now know those areas were not, rather than being redundant, they're actually what we call association cortices. They are some of the most important parts of the brain that we have that are, are, are for the most sophisticated mental functions. Uh, the reality is, of course, that we use, uh, we use all of our brains. Uh, you can see this uh, if someone lies in a brain scanner. You, you can see the activity uh, uh, swirling through the whole brain. If someone suffers... Sadly, sometimes even just small amount of brain damage, it can have devastating effects. Uh, of course, we are capable of more. You know, we all have potential to learn more, perform better, acquire more knowledge. Of course, we do. Um, but that doesn't mean that we have, you know, uh, that we're only using a smaller part of our brain. So it's this confusion between, you know, what amount of our brain are we using and human potential, really. So I, I think the message of potential is, is a powerful one. Um, and of course, people can recover very well often from brain damage. Uh, the, the buzzword is neuroplasticity, you know. But just because the brain can sometimes uh, adapt to brain damage doesn't, and to lost brain cells doesn't mean those brain cells weren't doing anything in the first place. OK. So next one, the uh, gender myth. So I just, the one I chose to put on the quiz was this idea of women's brains being more balanced. Uh, okay, it is, there are differences between men's and women's brains. It's, it's important to get that clear. So on average, so men's brains, for example, on average are bigger. Uh, there are individual structures within the brain that on average differ between men and women. So for example, women have on average a larger hippocampus the area, area involved, an area involved in memory. But unfortunately, what happens is a lot of people, uh, writers and authors, journalists and what have you, uh, campaigners, educational campaigners sometimes, they spin kind of bad neuroscience to suit their agenda or to bolster gender stereotypes. So this chap, uh, John Gray, in, in this book, um, he says, uh, for example, he makes out that... Uh, when men perform tasks that uh, we only use a specific part of our brain uh, localized, whereas women use a sort of dis distributed uh, network of brain areas. And then he uses this spurious claim to explain behavioral differences between the sexes. So he says at one point, um, it, it, this is why men can only think about one thing at a time. So he says he, he may be focusing on how to get that promotion, so he forgets to bring home the milk, for example. And okay, some of you might be thinking this rings true. Uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, the point is, there's no, you know, don't hang it on dodgy neuroscience because it's not helpful. And in other cases, it's used uh, as it was with this study at the end of 2013. It's used to uh, bolster, like I said, gender stereotypes. So this was a... Uh, a study looking at connectivity in the brain. And the researchers were culpable here too. They, they, in their press releases, they said they'd found uh, that men have more connectivity within each hemisphere, like front to back. And they said women have more connectivity across the hemispheres. And then, in, like I said, in the way they pr promoted this to the press, they said, you know, this helps explain, as we see in this headline, this helps explain why men are better at map reading, for example, they said, and why women are better at multitasking and so on. But it's important to realize that I mean, they did, this study didn't even have any tasks. It, it was a pure connectivity study. There were no tasks in it at all. The, the gender differences were minute, uh, and, it's, and it's one study, and the differences that were found are not necessarily hardwired. You know, they could be a consequence of how girls and boys, when they grow up, tend to start doing things differently because of cultural pressures and so on and so forth. It's, in some cases, some people really 
take the biscuit. So this is uh, from the US. This is a slide. Uh, I found it on the language log blog. It's a slide used by an educator in the US who goes around lecturing uh, and goes around saying how neuroscience can help inform how to teach girls and boys differently. And he says, girls see the details of experiences because they have a crocus that's four times larger than boys. Might sound convincing uh, to some audiences, but the trouble is there is no such brain structure as the crocus. So, <laughs> um, so, oh, and lastly, I was gonna say, so there's a chap, there's a psychologist in the States called Leonard Sachs, who uh, he campaigns for single sex education. And he's another one of these people who likes to use neuroscience to uh, give weight to his arguments. And in, in this book, just to take one example, he uses a study uh, where he says boys can't talk about their feelings and emotions as well as girls because their amygdala, an emotional brain area, isn't as well connected to the, their frontal lobes. If you go and look at the study that he cites, <clears throat> it had uh, nine, nine boys in it, 10 girls. It's a very small study. And the brain scanning t technology that was used doesn't allow you to look at connectivity. It wasn't that kind of study. It wasn't that kind of brain scan. So you know, it's it's uh, using neuroscience it, um, to to support arguments in a way that isn't justified. And actually, if you, in case you're wondering, you know, uh, there are studies that look at single sex education. Is it beneficial? This is a meta analysis which means it's gathered together loads of evidence from lots of different studies. Uh, I think it was 187 studies involving over 1.6 million students, and they found no evidence to support single sex education. So I find that more convincing than the dodgy brain scan evidence. Okay, learning styles. This is another huge, very, very popular idea. There are learning styles conferences and associations and societies, and there are hundreds of books. Uh, lots of people find it very intuitive, that this idea that we do learn better if we're taught through the medium that we prefer. Uh, the, the trouble is, well, there's, there are several issues with this, though. Um, so one of them is when you actually look at the studies that have tried to do this. So just this is a kind of simplified idea of what uh, 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 demonstration of what's been done. So let's say you have a group of people who say they are verbal learners. That's how they identify themselves. They prefer to learn verbally. Uh, and they're either taught by their preferred style or the one they don't like visually. Let's say they're learning elect electronics, which is one, one of the topics in one of the studies. Uh, another group, they prefer to learn visually. And they are either taught their preferred way or they're taught uh, <coughs> the way they don't like verbally. Now, what happens when you look at the evidence, typically, is that both groups do better, not according to their preferred style, but they do better with one of the methods that best matches the material being taught. That's what you need to always find. Um, so to take, you know, to take a very extreme, simplified example, you know, if you're learning a bike, learning how to ride a bike, and you're, you think you're a, visual, uh, a verbal learner, actually verbal learning is not gonna help you learn to ride a bike, to take a very extreme example. You know, often it is the nature of what's being taught that uh, best dictates uh, the, the right medium. And often actually it's a mixture of uh, uh, forms of information and delivery that helps improve learning, as we'll, we'll see a bit later on. Uh, another issue is that actually when psychologists have looked, people are not really very good at judging their preferred learning style. So people who think they prefer to learn one way, like verbally rather than visually or auditorily or whatever it might be, then when you go and test their learning uh, according to these different modalities, they're actually, most of us are poor judges at, at uh, working out which is the best way for us. Another issue is that there are absolutely overwhelming number of uh, systems that have been proposed now for different learning styles. And a study recently, um, well, actually, it's about 10 years ago, looked through the literature and looked through different programs that are in operation to find how many different ways there are now of categorizing people's learning styles. Uh, and they found there are 71 different 
systems are being promote, proposed. So like the most obvious, the one I mentioned, like is verbal, visual, auditory. There are others like uh, intuitive uh, versus analytical and so on. There are about 71 of these. And uh, recently, these psychologists pointed out, now if you were to grade, each, like, if each of us was to complete all of the questionnaires to find out where we fit on these different systems, that means there would be two to the power of 71 different types of learner in the world, which ends up at that number of different learning preferences, <laughs> which is more than the number of people on the planet. So it all, get, it all gets very complicated and silly very quickly. OK, uh, finally, uh, the, the brain gym, uh, which mo most of you are skeptical about here, but there were a lot of you who were supportive of it. It is very, very popular. Uh, teachers seem to love it. Lots of children seem to really enjoy it. I think the issue that I take with it and other people in neuroscience take with it is that it's sort of dressed up. A lot of these exercises are dressed up in uh, neuroscientific uh, jargon, which is actually uh, Neuro nonsense. It's, it's, a lot of it is really, really just made up stuff. They talk about um, brain buttons in your sternum that you press to increase blood flow to your, your brain. And I liked what Cl uh, Colin Blakemore, the neuroscientist, said about that. He said that's like trying to fix or improve your central heating in your house by pr pressing on the walls of your house. It's not going to, it's not going to, pressing here is not going to change your brain function. Uh, Another activity in, in the brain gym system in schools is um, they do these theatrical yawns. They do these things where you like, push your tongue to the roof of your mouth, or children do, supposedly to help increase blood flow to emotional parts of their brain. And it's, uh, if you look into the, uh, uh, the, the theoretical arguments that brain gym give, you find a lot of it is very questionable. They're allied with these groups that believe we have energy meridians and so on. You know, it's complementary medicine type stuff, which is I, I don't want to, to dismiss all that, but the trouble is they're dressing that kind of thinking up in the vernacular of modern neuroscience, which is unhelpful and misleading. They, they also subscribe to this theory that children need to complete each stage of motor development uh, before they go on to the next in order to mature mentally. So if, if a child walks before it crawls, they think that's bad for development, and the child needs to go back and learn to crawl. It's called the Doman uh, Delicato theory, and there's no evidence to support it. it and on, you know, this is how it goes on. Um, it, it, nonetheless, it's very, very popular. Like I said, 87 countries, 40 languages. It's been translated into Brain Gym. 39% uh, of teachers use it. In, in our country. There aren't many studies that have directly tested the claims. There are a couple that I found. This one uh, from 2007 found no evidence to support it whatsoever. They said teachers are wasting money and resources and time. Uh, and this one a bit later from 2010 similarly found no evidence to found no new evidence beyond the 2007 one. Uh, I liked what. Uh, I saw on Twitter the other day Nate Cornell. He's a psychologist in the States who has done a huge amount of research on memory and learning. And he said sarcastically, you need to know how brains work to teach, just like dogs need to know physics to catch a frisbee. <laughs> and I think he's right. That is where we're at right now. Although there is this hunger and passion to use findings about the biology of the brain to help us learn better, we're not at that stage yet. We might be one day soon, and it, these are exciting times, but we're not there yet. The good news is the Wellcome Trust uh, last year announced a £6 million project to help bring together neuroscience and education to really try and get some genuine neuroscience initiatives, you know, rather than things like Brain Gym, some genuine uh, breakthroughs. So you know, I would definitely say watch this space in the next few years. That's not to say there aren't. Uh, some very important findings that have been made uh, about how we learn and about memory, which I'm sure you will be familiar with many of them. And so for the uh, second half of my talk, I'm going to go through five tricks or tips and, uh, that can help in learning. These are really psychology. They're not neuroscience, although they're sometimes packaged as kind of brain tips. It's really psychology. <coughs> OK, so the first one, 
this came out uh, very recently. The first one is that people learn more effectively when they think the material they are learning that they are going to have to teach it themselves. So this idea, uh, this is from a study published just last year, only a few months ago. And in this study, uh, they split 56 students into two groups. Uh, they had 10 minutes to study a 1500 word passage on charge of the light brigade. Uh, crucially, one, heart, one group was told, uh, after you've done this, you're going to have to teach this material to someone else. Whereas the other group thought they were just going to be tested on it. And uh, OK, then 25 minutes later, as there, were, there was no teaching. Instead, both groups were tested. And the teaching group uh, recalled more facts, they re and they recalled them uh, more quickly. And uh, the researchers think that's because when we think we're going to have to teach something, it, it, we organize the information differently. We integrate it with our prior knowledge uh, better. And we also tend to focus more on the main points as well, the important. You know, we, we, we spend some time identifying what are the most important points. OK, so if, uh, we're going to go interactive again for this. So for each of these tips, uh, or tr you know, these principles, some of them are quite new, you know, and they're small studies, so it's not, you know, it's not the final word. But I thought what would be good after each one, we just spend two minutes, uh, again, like you did before, chatting with people behind you, like whether you, what do you think of this, whether you could use it in your own training or learning or teaching, uh, whether you think it's useful, whether it will stand the test of time. And then, uh, I'll ask you for some feedback afterwards, and we can see what we think. And we, we've got four more of these. OK, so over to you for a couple of minutes. OK, what, what did you think? Is this, is this something you've experienced yourselves? Uh, it, it, could it be useful, do you think? As a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, well, go, go. Oh, yeah. And it's been quite interesting. And actually, they're really helpful. Yeah. Well. Um, that's obviously important. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one issue that is highlighted by these researchers is obviously it'd be very time, it's very time consuming to give people who study the chance to then teach themselves. Uh, but of course, you don't, you know, it only has to really be the expectation that you might have to teach. So if you're doing group work, you could just tell a group, well, one of you will have to teach it next week. And so if, you've just, you know, if you know you might have to do it, then that could be enough to provoke these kind of d deeper learning. Maybe. It's not basically fear. <laughs> fear, <laughs> yeah. It's always good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Has anyone done any research on the long-term retention? Not just 25 minutes, but does it have an impact if you think you have to teach it? that you remember it better a week, a month? Yeah, then, no, that needs to be looked at. That's yeah. be very interesting yeah. if it improves long-term. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. It's not an extension of Bruna. You know, Bruna says, you know, the, the teaching of it is mm. very effective. I know, as a teacher, mm. you know, there were, there were concepts I learned as an engineer that I had no idea, really, they just worked. Mm. It wasn't until I had to teach them that I understood them because I had to systematically analyse yeah. them compartmentalize it and deliver it over and over again. Makes you think about it differently, doesn't it? Yeah. OK, let's go to the next one. Uh, so our memory for information is strengthened by the act of recall. This is also known as the testing effect. Uh, uh, you may have heard of it. It's very, very powerful, very, very important finding in memory and learning research. And just to give you one example of a study demonstrating this. Uh, this was from um, 2008. So this study, they split uh, two groups of students uh, into two groups uh, to learn English Swahili word pairs. There were 40 word pairs. So first of all, they, they made it so that both groups had successfully learned uh, all 40 pairs. That was the kind of baseline. 
So they've all learned, they've all successfully remembered them once. Uh, but then the, the crucial bit is what came next, because then they did, they sort of had eight more uh, study episodes uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, and one, now, well, crucially, you see one group, uh, once they'd done a test on, on, a, on a pair and they'd got it correct, uh, they no longer tested themselves on that pair again. They, studied, they carried on studying it through these eight repetitions of the word pairs, but they were no longer tested. The other group carried on being tested on all 40 word pairs, regardless of whether you know, they'd already got the right answer. So the di key difference between the two groups is no difference in how much time they spend passively studying the words. The, cru the crucial difference is that one group carried on being tested on all all the pairs all the way through. And there's a big, big difference between them when they were given a test a week later. So the, the group that kept on uh, being tested on the word pairs scored 80% versus 30% for the group who only studied them. And actually, I mean, this is a very simplified account of what they did. It, it gets more interesting with some of the detail because actually, uh, for example, they had they, they, had, uh, they looked at different, many more other conditions. And in one condition, you see, um, it, they, they took away the studying time, the passive studying time. And it didn't really make much difference. It's the, it was the testing that was very powerful. And that's because psychologists say, you see, testing, we often think of testing as a neutral uh, task to perform as a way of measuring what we know. We don't think of it as actually a very, very important part of the learning process, but it is because that act of retrieving uh, information, attempting to retrieve information, ha makes it information, uh, strengthens it in, in our memory. And uh, yeah, so, it, and this repeated, do, doing it that repeatedly, like keep testing yourself, it slows down forgetting. That's the effect that it has. OK, so uh, over to you again for two minutes. See if, if this is something that you were aware of. Um, I should point out that you know, uh, students, according to th this, these researchers anyway, most students, they don't realize this about testing. Few students, like if you give students time to revise by themselves, they, they will rarely test themselves. They will mostly you know, try and just study the material, uh, stare at it, try and learn, in this case, vocabulary. That, you know, they want to spend time trying to, you know, force the information into their brains. They don't realize that actually the testing is a really important learning bit. So I don't know, maybe, I don't know if you are familiar with this. Uh, so yeah, see, chat, chat among yourselves again for two minutes and see what you think and whether it could change how you do things. I don't think it matters as long as it's the same information that you're attempting to recall. It's the act of trying to retrieve what you had previously studied. You could test it through a different, you could find a new way of, I suppose, testing that same information. The important point is that the person is trying to recall and trying to dig it out of their memory. And that, that act of doing that actually strengthens memories. There's a study came out just last year and found as well that even like when you get an answer wrong, you know, it's, as long as you get the feedback of the correct answer, you don't need to worry about making tests too difficult because as long as you give people the correct answer, still even answering wrongly benefits they found memory long term for the right answer. So can I, I mean, my daughter's a primary school teacher mm. and she teaches the four to seven year olds. So it's very little one she teaches. Yeah. And she actually left the state school system because she couldn't cope with the national curriculum, testing, 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 testing. She said all it did, and, and she said all it did was actually dampen all the creativity and learning through play mm. that she did with the children. And it then and it actually mattered what they got, what score they got in the mm. test. And then that made the children who didn't, you're saying it doesn't matter the fact that they're, they're doing mm. the testing is enough. But then you get these little ones in tears mm. because they're, they're, they're failures. Yeah, I can I, see that. It needs to be done carefully. It does yeah. worry me. Almost mm. I mean, I, 
I'm sure it's right. Well, this is to do with, work, yeah, this is to do with using it as a way to learn, learn. rather than a way yeah. Yeah. to score people yeah. on how good it's they are. It's part of yeah. the process, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So yeah. it's actually, you know, it's almost, there's not a, oh, I think what you're saying is it's not a right or wrong. It's actually, yeah. what am I remembering? What am I not remembering? Yeah. And therefore I remember what I haven't remembered. But the system wants to count mm. all. Mm. Yeah. What's the best moment in the recall? Can you tell uh, me what, what is the difference in the validity of this as information recall exactly. versus performance in the job in the workplace? Sorry, where's that? It's the difference between this as information recall yeah. And performance in the workplace, is there a difference? Oh, uh, can you tell me? I don't, I mean, I don't, you've got probably more experience of doing this in the workplace than I have. So that's one of the reasons I was throwing back to you, whether it is this actually useful in real life, you know. That's what, there was a gentleman who started talking yeah. down there. What's, okay. what's the best moment for doing the recall if you have a test like in a month, for example, or in two weeks? Uh, we might be coming on to that next. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Um, I was just thinking about relating it to what I write notes with everything I do. Mm. I very rarely go back and look at them. Mm. The act of doing that yeah. helps. Is that similar to what we're experiencing here when you're testing <coughs> what I'm doing by writing my own notes about what I've written? Like? Writing notes is definitely a good, yeah, it's slightly different, but it, 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 it could be because as you're doing, you're writing your notes, you are having Recalling. to recall the information, yeah. aren't yeah. you? So you're, in a way, going through that process, so, yeah. Uh, I think we better move on to, we can have more questions out, you know, right at the end uh, as well, hopefully. Um, so the next one is, uh, we learn some types of information better when we combine passive studying uh, with drawing the concepts ourselves. And uh, this again, very recent study came out last year I said uh, some types of information because, as you'll see, this is this was in the context of science, uh, learning how uh, about influenza, and the material was very much about a causal chain. That this, that's what the students were learning really about a causal chain of events. So it's maybe you know definitely more research needed to see how much this generalizes. But in this study, uh, the, the two groups. Um, we're studying influenza, and one group, uh, they were given, they, they were actually given a, a kind of a template to draw on, and they were given a legend with some items to include in their drawing. So that's another caveat. You know, they weren't just left to their, completely to their own devices. They had some sort of aids to help them. Uh, the other group, they both spent the same amount of time, uh, but one group, like I say, drew the concepts that they were learning. And then afterwards, both groups were tested, and the group that had drawn, as well as just studied, uh, they outperformed the control group. Uh, there were different kinds of tests. One of them was a multiple choice. They outperformed 61% to 44%. And a very important uh, detail is that they, the researchers also looked to see, well, what happens if we just, maybe it's just looking at the, you know, once they've done the drawings, maybe it's the looking at the drawings they've produced that's helpful, rather than the drawing process. So they, they had a control condition where they gave one group drawings produced by the author of the text, and that didn't have the same benefits. So it seemed to be something about uh, spending time. Uh, you, you talked about writing notes. So this was obviously they're spending time thinking, how can I illustrate the concepts I've learned? And um, again, it's similar principles. You know, the, re the psychologists think this is to do with uh, by draw spending time drawing it. You know, you're coming at the information from a slightly different angle. You're integrating it maybe in different ways uh, with what you already knew before and so on. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, this was, you know, obviously there's some things you can't, you're not going to be able to draw, are you? And so this could potentially limited to certain kinds of learning. But uh, again, see, uh, chat among yourselves again for a couple of minutes. See whether, you know, is this something you've ever done yourself? Is it something you've tried? Do you believe this finding? You know, it's just one study. Do you, uh, do you believe, uh, and so on, and uh, we'll come back in two minutes now. Uh, so this ties in with the question someone said earlier about uh, leave, you know, how much time to leave. Um, okay, the optimal time to leave before revisiting material you've studied uh, depends on how long to go until your big test. You know, so it depends on whether you're interested in short-term <laughs> retention or long-term. 
And this, this really pertains to this idea. Uh, uh, so once we have learned something, if you think of vocabulary again, because it's, it's simple, you've got all your word pairs, you've learned them all. OK, now imagine you've got an hour more you want to devote to this. And psychologists call that overlearning. Uh, when are you going to spend that hour? Are you going to spend it immediately, which is what lots of people do? You know, they, they've, they've got all the answers right, they've got all the, all the vocab right, and then they, they, they spend another hour, you know, really, really trying to learn this deeply, straight away. Now, is that the right thing to do? Or is it better to not, you know, you've got all the vocab right, is it, leave it now, I'm going to spend my hour tomorrow looking at it again, or maybe in a week's time. So this principle is all about how long do you wait before you review what you've already learned. Obviously, uh, you know, you could go back to it every single day. But so this, to simplify things, what these researchers do is they imagine you're only going to go back to it once more. When's the optimal time to go back? Um, and they, they find that uh, the longer you want to remember the information for, the, the longer you should leave it before revisiting. Because that overlearning, they call it massing, so that immediate sort of overlearning straight away is not, is, is, it, it has short term benefits, but it drops off, the benefit drops off very sharply. So if you, your test is, uh, is like a month away, you should wait and do that review uh, nearer. Uh, they, they've, they've studied this carefully, they've looked at all different times, so like they've varied where, how long the, the big test is after the second review. Um, and they say you should, the gap you should leave between your first, when you've mastered it initially, and your review is 10 to 30 percent of the time uh, between your last review and the big test. Um, so, for example, one paper had people study uh, some vocab, and then they, the students had one chance to review what they'd learnt. And the, then the test always came 10 days after that review. Um, OK, so I, I don't know if you can, uh, it's a little bit, it can be tricky to get your head around, but the, the, the big test always came 10 days after the, the chance of reviewing what they'd learnt. And what, what the psychologist did is vary the time of when the review occurred. So the review could occur five minutes after they'd mastered the vocab, all the way up to 14 days, uh, two, two weeks later. Now, for a test that comes 10 days after that review, uh, study time period, the optimal gap to leave is one day. OK, so, uh, and, and, uh, so the longer you want the information to keep, you know, you need to retain the information, the bigger gap you need to leave between your, your initial learning and uh, your, when you revisit the material. Uh, they, they did another study just to help illustrate it. Uh, in this case, the, the big test came a month after the second review. And in this case, it, it was better uh, to, lead, to study the material. Uh, or you've mastered it, and then leave a month before revisiting, because now you want to retain it six months later. OK. Uh, right, OK, you could, so um, have we got, yeah, just one minute maybe to just chat among yourselves whether you were aware of this. It's called the spacing effect. It's to do with, like I said, long-term retention. Um, yeah, chat among yourself, see if you were aware of this, whether it's something you maybe do intuitively. Um, okay, and I'll come back in one minute. <laughs> Any thoughts? This is my biggest criticism of the, the, the claims that we put up about the efficacy of e learning, because in a traditional program, the summative assessment is often days, weeks, months after learning events, but often mm. if you're doing a bit of compliance training, you do all your module tests and then you've got a summative test just before you log out. And so, you know, rather than in between, rather than yeah, so revisiting it. A day or a week before you go back in yeah. and do your summative assessment, yeah. you're doing it almost immediately. You, you yeah. fresh out of learning and then you walk away and you forget it yeah. because of everything else is spacing. Yeah. So it'd be better to have a review in between yeah. that first time. And yeah, it's true in text, but the way like textbooks are often written as well. You know, the material in one chapter, the tests come at the end of that chapter, and then that's it, end of. Whereas it'd be better if the questions pertaining to that chapter came again later in the book. So. OK, let's quickly go on to the last one. Uh, this is very provisional. 
this one because it's a very, very small study. But uh, I'm sure you all know that sleep is incredibly important uh, for learning. Uh, this is uh, like studies with rats, for example, have shown while they're sleeping uh, mazes that they've learnt during the day. You can see the activity in their brains uh, sort of being replayed while they sleep, almost as if they're rehearsing the maze while they're sleeping. Uh, this study takes things a little bit further because we already know then that learning, uh, sleep is very vital for learning. This one looked at the fact that obviously there are different kinds of learning. You can learn facts uh, or you can learn procedural skills, you know, like learning the piano or riding a bike. And they wondered if, the be if there's an optimal time of day to do those two different kinds of activities, you know, the, a factual one or a what, as they call, uh, procedural learning. So they divided teenage girls into two groups, um, and they, le they learned either word pairs uh, or a finger-tapping task, which is a bit like learning the piano or something. Um, now, crucially, they, they did this. They did their um, study of these two different things, either at 3 p.m. or 9 p.m. in the evening. They made sure that their performance right after uh, in both those groups was the same. So they both reached the same level, regardless of whether they did it at 3 p.m. or 9 p.m. They've reached the same standard. Um, then they, both, they were, all of them were retested 24 hours later or one week later. And so the interesting thing was to see was, did it make a difference what kind of activity you learned and when you learned it to your long-term retention? And they found an interesting effect, because they found that the, the, the girls who were learning words, uh, they did better on those later tests if they'd initially done their learning in the afternoon. Whereas the finger tapping group, which you can think of as similar to having your music lessons, uh, they did better at the later tests if they'd done their original learning in the evening at the 9 p.m. slot. And like I say, it's a very preliminary study the researchers admit they don't really know why. They think it maybe is to do with because there are different memory mechanisms behind these two different types of learning. And perhaps the consolidation process, uh, you know, when sleep kicks in, the timing of when you go to sleep, how that interacts with the memory consolidation process is different for the two types of learning. That's what they're assuming. So if it's like your music lesson, it's beneficial to go to sleep uh, sooner. Because obviously, if you do your piano at 9 p.m., you're going to go to bed sooner. So they think it's some interaction between the, you know, this consolidation process and when you go to sleep. But uh, it's early days. Um, I think as we're due to end very imminently, rather than th I'll leave that one to you to discuss afterwards, uh, to think about afterwards, and we can just have general questions now. Does that make sense? Because yeah. we're nearly at, at the time. I just say like. Um, I think all these prints, these five tricks, you know, there are some common themes in them. A lot of it is about uh, integrating, you know, the, these different tasks and things, not this last one, but the, the others. It's often about uh, encouraging learners to integrate what they know, to come at it from different angles, to use uh, what they've learned as well. Like the most powerful learning, they say, is incidental learning, rather than the learning you do where you just sit down and your explicit objective is to try, I want to learn this. The most powerful learning comes incidentally when you're using that skill or knowledge in you know, the course of some activity, uh, that, then that, that's the most powerful learning. Um, like I say, the neuroscience is not really helping all that much at the moment. This is, these things are more psychology principles. But hopefully, you know, maybe to a you know, few years' time, we will see some genuine neuroscience insights. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. It's been a pleasure to be here. And uh, this is the first half of my talk. You can find, like, if you liked that, there's a lot more of that in my new book. And you can get a discount at wiley.com by entering this code. Thank you very much. Well, that's, that's great. And a great follow-on from this morning. So we've definitely had our brains expanded, haven't we? Um, so just a couple of quick questions. We are pretty close to the wire on the timing, but I'm sure people are happy to sit here for a couple more minutes just to get the benefit of some of Christian's knowledge and experience and thoughts. So let's have, we've got one here. Uh, 
So can I just repeat the question, because we didn't have a micro, which is how do we know what to believe? That, you know, Christian could be saying this one day, somebody could say something another day. Where, where, where do we land with this? Uh, well, there are, some rule, there are some rules of thumb that you can use. So, like, with, if you're trying to spot neurobolics, for example, yeah. you know, you can ask yourself, would it make any difference if I took the word brain out of what's being claimed? Would it, is, is the, are the references to the brain in neuroscience gratuitous, or are they really adding meaning? Because often you find it's, it's really a way to dress up claims that are really based in psychology to make them sound maybe like harder science. That's one thing. You can also look for, uh, you may have heard of meta-analyses. This is where researchers, they gather, rather than it just being one study, because I admit these principles I showed you, I was just singling out single studies. But a good thing to do is look for meta-analyses that gather together. They average, you know, across loads of studies, and, and they find a kind of average effect. And also, I don't know, maybe look, you can look to, you know, is, does the person have an agenda? Lots of people, I don't know, I won't name any names, but they seem to have a bit of an, you know, an agenda. Maybe they're trying to sell something. Like Brain Gym, it's obviously, it's a commercial, they don't make any bones about it. It's a commercial business. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, there's some right. things like that. <laughs> Another one, we've got uh, this one here, and then we've got one over there which we'll take, and then we need to wrap up. Thank you for that. It was a, a great presentation. I guess a couple of your myths around uh, left, uh, right brain thinking and learning styles. I know they're very much embedded in the organization I work in, and I'm sure other organizations too. Um, and there's a lot of people out there who consider themselves experts in those areas. Have you had any response from them regarding the fact now that you consider what they are doing from a neuroscience perspective Myths. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Well, I write a blog for Wired called Brainwatch, where I tackle some of these things. I read most recently. I looked at Neurosonic, this brain drink that can boost your supposedly boost your concentration. But yeah, whether it's that or learning styles, I've discussed learning styles. Yeah, I, I do get quite a lot of um, correspondence. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. I guess I'm going back into my organization and I'm wondering, should I be stripping these out of things like learning style questionnaires, out of programs that we have? And, you know, I know we have one program that's built around left and right brain thinking. So it's, it's I similar I to would, I, who yeah. do we believe? I would you argue know? that you should, but, if, yeah. you know, I understand that if in personal experience in the real world, people enjoy it and you find it useful, I do appreciate, you know, that that's important. But I, yeah, personally, I think it's important not to misuse neuroscience and why hang things like that on completely spurious ideas. I, I don't think it's, you know, I... Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, everyone's different, aren't they? I mean, yeah. it's like some people believe passionately in ghosts, for example. <laughs> you know, you can argue with them till you're red in the face about, well, about the evidence, but... Obviously, different things have meaning for people, mm -hmm. personally meaningful, and I, I know that's important too. So, and you've got to be practical, haven't you, in real life? If, it, if, if people find like, your questionnaire useful or whatever, then... We did have one more question in the middle here. Who was, yeah, there's a gentleman in the middle there that put his hand up before. Hi, As, uh, this is all changing so rapidly. How do you keep up to date with the latest uh, that, uh, ideas that are coming out and the latest neurobolics as well? <laughs> uh, well, there are some great blogs that you can follow. <laughs> um, not, yeah, not, I mean, my day job is I write about new research for the British Psychological Society. So that's personally how I obviously, I get to keep up with a lot of new stuff. But uh, for the interested person who do, uh, has a proper job, um, <laughs> there are, well, I mean, there, there are blogs like, there's Neuroskeptic, I would recommend. Uh, there's Neurocritic. There's Neurobonkers blog. Uh, yeah, there's my own Brainwatch blog. Uh, the, uh, for the more psychology stuff, there's the BPS Research Digest, which is yeah, what I, I edit and write in my day job. Uh, New, New Scientist, I think, magazine is really good. They have a lot of psychology and practical findings in there. Um, yeah, there are, there are outlets. 
we're trying to keep up. Great. Yeah. Okay, last question, gentleman at the back there. Thank you. I will need a microphone. Thank you. Thank you. What are your thoughts on LP? <laughs> 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 Briefly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then it seems to be some sort of negative... Yeah. Great question. It's, it's not grounded in genuine neuroscience, um, basically. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I won't go on the course, then. Pardon? I won't go on the course, then. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's sort of... Uh, it's not really recognised by mainstream psychology and neuroscience, but, again, it's a bit like the left brain, right brain thing, you know, I know a lot of people, like from an anecdotal perspective, you know, will swear by it. So it depends on whether you, how much faith you put in the scientific process versus people who kind of virtually make up some of these systems and create whole industries around them because the whole industry spreads. You know, you go and do a short course, you get a title that says you're an NLP master, what's it? And, um, you know, no wonder it becomes self-sustaining because yeah. pe once people have invested time and money in it, they want to believe in it. But yeah, I, I, I can't support it myself. Great stuff. All right. Well, great questions. And I'm sure Christian will be loitering around in the uh, foyer area if you want to nobble him and ask him a few more. <laughs> um, but uh, again, thank you very much to Christian for a really enlightening thank presentation. You. Thanks.